Acts chapter 3 is where we are. We're, we're uh, in the middle of a uh, series uh, this summer in the book of Acts. This is going to be a summer-long series that's going to take us um, probably into September. Um, there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. Um, we're not going to hit all 28 chapters. That would be a really long series. But for the rest of the summer, um, I'm going to do my best to pick out a few stories from the book of Acts that we're going to look at, read about, and apply to our lives. And we started last week in Acts chapter 1, talking about the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 is all about the Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus tells his disciples after he died, rose again, the Bible says he stayed on earth for a period of 40 days, and then he tells his disciples, go wait in Jerusalem and wait for the promise that my Father will send you. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 then, the Holy Spirit falls on 120 believers in an upper room, and they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So last week we talked all about the role, the function, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, Tonight we're gonna to be in Acts chapter three. I do just wanna quickly summarize Acts chapter two because there's, there's like one main thing I kinda of wanna to touch on here in Acts chapter two and then we'll read Acts chapter three together. Um, so Acts chapter two, in the first eight verses, you're gonna see that the Holy Spirit falls on believers and they're empowered with the Holy Spirit. The Bible then says that Peter, he preaches the first evangelistic message to thousands of people. It's the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was one of three major Jewish feasts where all Jewish males were required to travel to Jerusalem. There are probably millions of people in the city of Jerusalem. And Peter, after being empowered by the Holy Spirit, he preaches the gospel message to a mass of a few thousand people probably. And the Bible actually says that many of the people responded, and I love this, it says in Acts chapter two at the end of the chapter in verse 37, it says after Peter preaches that the people are cut to the heart and they ask, what must we do? What can we do to be saved? And I love it says that people were cut to the heart. I don't know if, if maybe you came to faith later in life and you just experienced that piercing effect when someone shared the gospel to you. The Bible says that these people, their, their hearts were cut. It's a Greek word that means to pierce or to sting. Guys, that's the effect that the word of God has on us. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, it says that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, even to piercing joints and marrow, soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Guys, that's the power of God's word. So Peter, he preaches the word of God. These people, they're cut to the heart. Never underestimate the power of God's word. Whether you're in Bible study or small groups, maybe you're just talking to someone who doesn't know the Lord, just keep it simple. Just talk about scripture because the power of scripture is that it pierces, it gets right to the inner soul of our being, just cut straight to the heart by the power of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. And that's what Peter does. He preaches the gospel. The people are cut to the heart and the Bible says in, at the end of this chapter that 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people are added to their number after Peter preaches. If you're in Acts chapter three, just turn the page to Acts chapter two. I wanna read just a few verses here, starting in verse 40. So this is after Peter preaches. The people are cut to the heart. What must we do to be saved? And then in verse 40 of chapter two, it says, and with many other words, Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly, so this is the, the, the church now, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So this speaks to the fundamental elements of their gathering. The four pillars of their gathering consisted of the word. They focused on the apostles' doctrine. It also, they also focused on fellowship. It's a Greek word koinonia. They also focused on communion, the breaking of bread, reminding them of Christ's sacrifice, and they focused on prayer. Those are the four pillars, honestly, that should hold up every single church. Keep it simple. Be devoted to the word, be devoted to fellowship, remember the sacrifice of Christ by partaking in communion and, and prayer. 
The Bible says that God's house should be called a house of prayer. So the early church, they gather upon these four elements. We're gonna focus on the word, fellowship, communion, prayer. Verse 43, it says, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All right, fear not in a crippling sense, but fear in just this healthy reverential awe towards the Lord. We need that in the church, amen? Just this fear of the Lord, not being scared of God, but just this healthy reverential awe of God. And when the believers get saved, they're cut to the heart, it says that they respond by fearing the Lord. They recognize his authority. So fear came upon the believers. Here's what I wanna park it on just real quick before we get into chapter three. It says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now a lot of people have really grabbed on to Acts 2.45. Listen, bro, the early church, let's take it back to Acts chapter two, bro. And they become really weird and honestly socialistic in their thinking in that let's just go back to the early church where they just sold everything. Because the Bible says that in verse 45, they sold all their possessions and goods and they divided them among all as anyone had need. So a lot of people have grabbed onto this like, bro, early church, let's just sell everything we have, all our possessions, let's just give it all away, let's come together in some kind of commune, bro. <laughs> and and it, people develop all these different socialistic ideologies, like the church should all just be about, just let's get together in a commune, live together, sell all of our possessions. This is not talking about socialism, guys, this is talking about survival. Let me give you a little bit of context, the first century church. The first century church, if you, now, the first century church, we have to keep in mind, this early church is made up of all Jewish believers. We don't see any Gentiles until Acts chapter 10, uh, Acts chapter 10 Cornelius gets saved, he's a Gentile. The first believers, they were all Jewish. You have to put yourself in their shoes. When you converted from Judaism to Christianity and you placed your faith and trust in Jesus as the Messiah, your family would disown you. They would reject you. You would be ostracized and alienated from your Jewish community. Still in modern day, today, strict Jews, uh, Jews, specifically Hasidic Jews, strict Orthodox Jews, if someone from your family gets saved and claims to follow Jesus as Messiah, they will have a funeral for you. That's how much they disown you. In the early church, if you then said, I am believing that Jesus is the Messiah, you would lose your business, no one would come and buy your products, uh, no one would sell anything to you, you would be destitute, you would lose everything. And so the early church, what they did was they pooled their resources together, not as means of, uh, of this socialistic ideology, but as means of survival. So they come out of their Jewish family saying, I believe Jesus is Messiah. They are rebuked, isolated, ostracized from their Jewish communities, no business. And so they come together and they're pooling their resources as means of survival. So I just wanna set up the, the context of the book of Acts. This is the early church here. Persecuted for now following Jesus as their Messiah. And all that being said, if God calls you to um, sell your stuff and give to the poor and go to the mission field, um, more power to you. The thing I love about the early church is that when the Holy Spirit fell on them and they turned from their sin and they came to Christ, it fostered this spirit of generosity that we need to recapture, especially in our uh, area where we can just be so gripped to our resources and our things and our material possessions. I love that the early church, they had this spirit of generosity within the church. Yes, as means of survival, but the Holy Spirit led them in such a way just to give over and share among the community of believers. So I love that. Then we hit Acts chapter three. So that's the foundation of the early church here. Ostracized from their Jewish communities, now pooling their resources together to share amongst the community of believers. 
Bible says they had all things in common. Listen, you know when you meet a fellow believer, it's like that. Like, you just, like, I feel like I've known you my whole life. We share the greatest thing in common, which is our love and uh, fellowship of, of Jesus. So all the believers here, they, it says they had everything in common. And now verse uh, one of chapter three, okay? This is where we're gonna pull from uh, and, and gain some application here. Let's read the first 10 verses together. I love this story, guys. Verse one, it says, now Peter and John, so two of Jesus' very closest disciples, Peter and John, they went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Isn't that just a great name for a gate? the gate, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, this lame man asked for alms. Verse four, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Really cool story, let's pray. God, we first just wanna pause and commit our Bible study to you, God. I pray now that you would teach us through this amazing story. Be our teacher tonight. Open up our hearts, Lord, as we study and learn from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen. I wanna unpack these verses with us, and there's some really cool application I think we can pull from it. Verse one, it says, Peter and John, they went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. So Jewish tradition says that there were three hours or three different times for prayer, 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. So verse one says they went to the temple at the hour of prayer, and this was the ninth hour. So they started their clocks at 6 a.m., so the ninth hour puts us at 3 p.m. It's the third time of prayer. So it's 3 p.m. in the afternoon, verse two says, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. So the Bible says that there's this lame man, and he's lame from birth. Don't exactly know what happened, but it just said from the time he was in his mother's womb, he was lame, he was paralyzed. And so, Uh, Actually, in chapter four, verse 22, it tells us this man's age, he's over 40 years old. So picture this, this 40-year-old man, lame from the time he was born. 40 years, this is your condition. And the Bible says that people, maybe some of his friends, maybe his family members, they carried this lame man who was crippled to this gate uh, at the city of Jerusalem, and the gate was called Beautiful, and we actually know if you go to Jerusalem with us, we have a couple trips coming up next year, um, we go to this gate. It's also called the uh, Eastern Gate as well as the Golden Gate. And so um, this is a wide shot of the city of Jerusalem, all right, the Gold Dome, that's a mosque. That is most likely where the Jewish temple around that area would have been situated. And right down here, this line of wall, you're gonna see a gate. I'm gonna zoom into it right there. So this is called the beautiful gate here, what we're reading, Acts chapter three, also called the Eastern Gate. Now, it's very interesting, if you see in this picture, you're gonna notice that the, the arches of the entrance of this gate, they're boarded up. All right, why? Well, Muslims, they know Jewish scripture, and what they did is they know that Jewish prophecy says that the Messiah will enter through the Eastern Gate at his second coming. So in an attempt to stop Jesus from entering this gate, they've actually boarded it up, as if that will stop Jesus. They've also, I don't know if you can see, right underneath the gate, 
they have placed a cemetery there. Now, why would the Muslims do that? They did that because, as Jewish tradition has it, no priest would ever walk through a cemetery because that would make them unclean. So seeing the Messiah, uh, thinking of the Messiah in terms of a priest, they have placed, they've boarded it up and they've placed a cemetery underneath thinking that no Jewish Messiah will come through this cemetery because it will make them unclean. So this is their attempt to stop Jesus. It's it's not going to work. But this is what they've done. But you can still go to Israel today and it's pretty cool you can see this gate. This is where our story takes place. So they bring this paralyzed man to the gate called Beautiful. And what I love about this story, um, let's keep reading here in verse 3. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I always insert myself into the narrative. I want you guys to do that with me. Verse 3, it says, This man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, uh, he asked for alms. So he's begging. Verse 4, And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. I don't know what kind of tone that was. That was like a harsh tone, like, look at us. Or if it was like a gentle, like, look at us. I I don't know. Verse four, fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Verse five, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. So this man's expecting to receive some kind of money. And then it says in verse uh, six, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Guys, put yourself in Peter's shoes. Peter is bold here. I don't know about you, but this is what I would have done. Okay, you have to think of it in terms of this. Acts chapter 1 and 2, Holy Spirit falls on believers. They're empowered now with the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't, up to this point, it doesn't record that any... Uh, healing has been done. Supernatural healing has been done. So this is the first ever recorded supernatural healing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter comes to this man and he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Guys, if that's me, if that is me, I am praying, Lord, please let this work. Please let this work. Please, like, do not let me look like a fool. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And I, like, kick at his ankles or something. And, like, and then I'm like, here, I'll just give you a hand up. Maybe this will work. And so the boldness of Peter, I just so admire here. Because I don't know about you. The, I'm just totally being honest with you. I'm going to have to repent for this later maybe. But the, the very first supernatural miracle I tried would be on someone who was blind. Because at least if it didn't work, they wouldn't ever remember who it was. Because they couldn't see me. So if it didn't work, okay, I'm gone. And they, and they just would have forgotten. Or they wouldn't have forgotten, but they would have, they, they were, there was no way to identify me. So I could just feel stupid, but they wouldn't know who it really was. So that's just me. But Peter, he's bold here. He, he comes to them, and I just love how he phrases this. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And here it says in verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Here's what I love about this chapter, and here's where where we'll draw our first point of application. Peter and John weren't necessarily avidly seeking out ministry. They weren't. Peter and John weren't avidly seeking out ministry. God, who can I heal today? God, how can you use my spiritual gifts today? Okay, they weren't, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with praying, God, how can you use my spiritual gifts today? I'm not knocking that. But what I love about this passage is they weren't necessarily avidly seeking out ministry opportunity. What were they seeking out? What were they trying to do? Pray. It says here in verse 1, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. So Peter and John were seeking out prayer. And as I was studying this passage, what 
the Lord just impressed upon my heart was just this disposition that we should always maintain as believers. It's not that we necessarily have to just avidly be looking for ministry opportunity, but listen, when you are a follower of Jesus and when you just discipline yourself to just routinely, daily, seek the Lord, pursue Jesus, pursue prayer, God will bring ministry opportunity to you. And it's nothing that you have to manufacture on your own. And guys, this should be a great encouragement to us. Just feeling the pressure, God, uh, who, are you, who should I minister to today? How can I use my spiritual gifts today? How can I seek different ministries of uh, opportunity today? And we just, you know, sometimes we're just avidly seeking ministry and when we're not presented with ministry and the doors don't open for us, we just feel like a failure. But what I'm just so encouraged by this story is Peter and John, they weren't avidly seeking ministry. They were just seeking to go to the temple and just pray because they were just pursuing Jesus. And guys, out of an overflow of just your daily pursuit after Jesus, God will bring ministry opportunity to you. He will open up the right doors at the right time to the right people. That's an encouragement to my heart. I hope it's an encouragement to yours. That they didn't force opportunity. They weren't even necessarily seeking ministry. But as they sought just to pursue Jesus, just to seek the Lord in prayer, the Lord brought ministry to them. And I think that this should be our disposition. I think this is how God often operates. As we just discipline ourselves just to pursue Jesus in prayer and in the word, in both our private and public lives, the Lord will often present us with ministry opportunities along the way. And that can be a very freeing thing because it takes the burden off of us to find the right people and it just says, Lord, who are you gonna bring me today? Here's what's incumbent upon us and here's what's challenging. Point number one, be willing to be interrupted. This is so challenging for me, guys, because as I just pray that, okay, the burden is not on me to avidly seek out people and ministry, but as I just am faithful daily in my life, just in my private life, in my public life, just to pursue Jesus in prayer and in the word, okay, God, you're gonna bring ministry opportunities to me. You're gonna open up those doors. Here's then what's incumbent upon us. You have to be willing to be interrupted. And this is so challenging for me and for us, especially in the area we live, because we are busy, busy, busy. We have our schedules, we have our calendars. We have our to-do lists, and we hate being interrupted because we need to get things done. And we plan our day at the beginning of the day. We, we, you know, in the morning, wake up, what am I gonna do today? You start just mentally, or maybe you have a notebook, start to write down your schedule for the day, and that's fine. I'm not saying don't do that. That can be a good pattern and a good routine to get into, but if, as followers of Jesus, we're not always directed by our schedules, we're guided by the Holy Spirit, we have to at times be willing to be interrupted. And that's what I love about Peter, Jane, uh, Peter and John here. They could have easily blown this guy off. All right, Peter and John, thousands of people entering into the gate to go to the, this ninth hour of prayer. If I'm Peter and John and I'm going for prayer, I could have easily just thought, this guy's here every single day, just begging for money. Someone else will take care of him. They could have easily blown by the guy he's begging and they say, listen, I'm, I'm here for prayer. I'm not here to heal you. Someone else can take care of you. Someone else can meet this need. But what do they do? They weren't seeking ministry, but when the Holy Spirit brought ministry to them, what did they do? They were willing to be interrupted. And in our fast-paced culture, in our fast-paced, busy, Loudoun County type schedules, we can so easily just zone out and zone into what our tasks are for the day. And so many times, guys, I've been convicted by the Lord because I've pushed people aside to just stay on task. And I'm not advocating for strangers and people in need to just con continually just consume your day because there will always be human need. Human need is endless. So I'm not saying just let people, outsiders, strangers, even people you know, just let people just control your day and control your schedule and consume your 
your day. I'm not advocating for that, but what I am saying and what can be so challenging is in the busyness of our lives, when we have our schedules, we have our goals, we have our routines, we just have to be willing to be interrupted by the Holy Spirit sometimes. I'll give you two personal examples from my life. One good example, one bad example. Um, where the first, I'll give you the good example, all right? Um, it was a Saturday, I had a lot of things to get done. You know, as a Saturday rolls around, you don't get too many weekends, and so weekends, especially for me now, as I, you know, I've, I'm married, I've got kids, uh, weekends for me are mowing the lawn for chores, getting stuff done, paying bills, all that stuff. And I know you guys pay bills, you have responsibilities. Sometimes you use your weekend just to knock out some of that stuff. So this was a day I had to go to the bank, went through, um, was, was about to go through the ATM. And so as I'm driving, I see this guy on the sidewalk and he's got this big cast on and he's in crutches. And this is a busy, uh, a busy street here in Leesburg and the guy's walking just on the sidewalk in this you know, busy downtown Leesburg Street, walking on crutches. And I just feel the Lord impress upon my heart, just stop for this guy, give this guy a ride wherever he's going. And I was fighting it, guys. It's like, Lord, I have a schedule, I have tasks, um, tasks that are God honoring, taking care of family, taking care of bills. God, I'm gonna stay on task. And I just, as I was just, because I, I was at the stoplight, so I had time to just kind of play this game with God, as this guy is just on crutches, slowly walking on the sidewalk. And I'm fighting it. God's like, I want you to stop. And I'm like, no, where would I stop? So I start justifying in my mind why I shouldn't stop. God, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna hold up traffic. Where can I, there's no place to stop, Lord. I would if there was a place. You know I would, Lord. But the Lord just continued to impress upon my heart, just wanted you to stop for this guy. So I did, I did. And I stopped by, I said, hey, you need a ride? He said, sure. So he hopped in and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm just, I need to get to Idly Rec Center because there's a bus stop there and that's where I'm going. And I said, yeah, easy, I can take you there. And so in our five minute drive, I took him to the bus stop and I, I just, obviously, if the Lord's gonna tell me to stop for this guy, I'm not just gonna be quiet and give him a ride. I'm gonna sh try to find a way to open up a conversation about the Lord with him. So I did. I have no idea if it sound, it kind of seemed like it went in one ear and out the other because he just was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, sure, that's awesome. And I dropped him off and I just prayed as I left. I said, God, just pray that maybe you planted a seed. I don't know how you're gonna use that, but I pray that you do. So that was a good day where I just allowed the Holy Spirit to interrupt my schedule. That is few and far between for me. The bad example I present to you happened just last week. I was um, here at the church and my wife texted me and she said, uh, hey, can you pick up some medicine for Ava? Ava was like having a little bit of a cold. And so I was like, yep, yeah, I'll stop by Target here in Leesburg, grab some medicine, I'll be on my way home. And so went to Target and um, I don't know about you, but this is, is kind of how I roll when I go out and I shop or I go to Target or whatever. I don't try to find the closest spot, all right? Ladies, stop asking us men to find closest spots. It's not gonna happen. We like to park further and then get in some good running jogging going on. So that's what I did. I, so I park far from Target, you know. I'm in the parking lot still. I'm not like across the street, but I'm in the parking lot. I park a little bit out of a ways so I can get just a nice little jog in. Because I just like, when I'm going somewhere, I know what I'm getting. And so like, I usually, if you see me around, I'm gonna probably be running around Target. Just don't freak out, it's just normal for me. So I run through the parking lot and literally, as I'm running through the parking lot, heading into Target, this lady steps into my pathway and says, excuse me, sir. And like, I immediately just became a little bit frustrated. Like, Target lady, I am jogging right now. Like, can you not see this? And so. I stop and I'm like, hey, hey, what's going on? And she says, I need, um, I need some groceries. Can you buy some groceries for me? And I, I asked her, I just probed her a little bit more. I was like, well, what, what's going on? Like, what do you need? And she's like, well, and she didn't have, she didn't speak great English. So through kind of like a, lo a longer conversation of trying to understand one another, I gathered that she needed some groceries for her kids. And she said, I just need some groceries for my kids. Would you be able to 
you know, take me through and, and buy some groceries. And I like, you know, guys, I'm on a schedule, I'm on a task. So I said, guys, I, I said, uh, target lady, listen, I, uh, I didn't really call her target lady, but that's, I don't know her name. I should have asked, but I'm like, listen, target lady, I need to go. And I said, I, my, my daughter needs some medicine. So I need to go. I'm trying to just be really quick. And I said, listen, if you come with me now, 10 minutes quick, I can just pick some stuff off the shelf for you, but that's all I can do right now. And she said, okay, well, how about Costco? And I said, I'm not trying to do bulk target lady. This is your target lady. You're not Costco lady. So I can't do bulk today. So I, 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 I wasn't that harsh, guys. I you know, tried to put on my pastoral disposition. I smiled and I said, listen, I can't do Costco today. I gotta do Target. So if you come now, pick some stuff off shelf and then we can, we, I can do that. And she said, okay, no, no thanks. And I was like, okay, well, I gotta go. So I'm, I'm kind of like having this conversation, like still backpedaling, like really trying to get on schedule. And as I'm like leaving, because I didn't, you know, take the time to stop and really just consider what was going on in her life and help her out. Um, I left and she said, okay, and she leaves and I'm jogging away and she says, God bless you. And I was like, cut to the heart. And the Holy Spirit, like as I'm running, running through Target, the Holy Spirit's like working on my heart and I'm driving back home and that's all I'm thinking about. God, I, I was not willing to be interrupted. And so I don't know maybe who the Lord has put in your path or where the Lord has maybe challenged you just to be interrupted at times. And again, I'm not trying to advocate for just let, let other people just consume your schedule and your day. Human need is endless, but we have to at times be discerning, God, is this a Holy Spirit inspired interruption? And I love that about Peter and John. Going to the temple, thousands of people walking through this gate for prayer. They have a task. Weren't seeking ministry, but the Lord opened the opportunity for them and they took it and they were like, hey, we're gonna be willing to be interrupted. And when you are willing to be interrupted by the Holy Spirit, you are going to see God's power move in a greater way than if you had not been willing to take that interruption. And we sell God short. We sell ourselves short. God could have, I'm convinced, in my life, shown me his power to a greater degree if I was willing to be interrupted by him. But because I had to stay on task, because I was busy, because I had to keep my schedule, I didn't get the privilege of seeing God's power move. And so again, it's not like you have to meet every human need or be interrupted by every single person you come in contact with. But what I am encouraging us is just to be sensitive to, God, when you bring ministry along, help me discern what's from you so that I can be interrupted today. And then when I'm interrupted, I'm gonna see your power move in such a great way. And because Peter and John were willing to be interrupted, they saw God's power and hand move. And this guy is miraculously healed. So number one, be willing to be interrupted. Our second and final principle, principle number two, comes from verses 11 through 19. So what happens is Peter and John, they're willing to be interrupted by the power of the Holy Spirit Peter heals this man who was paralyzed for 40 years and it creates chaos in Jerusalem. Verse 11. Now as the lame man who was helped held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Guys, check out Peter's response. I love it. Why look so intently at us as though by our own power or our godliness, we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now, Peter's a little harsh here with them, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Remember that. The people gave up Barabbas in place of Jesus. Verse 15, you killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. 
And his name, through faith in Jesus' name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Verse 17, yet now, brothers, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, verse 19, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Principle number two, finally, be a generation that preaches repentance. Be a generation that preaches repentance. Peter heals this man, chaos in Jerusalem. Now, this is a situation where Peter could have been tempted to receive some glory here. All right, first recorded spiritually miraculous healing takes place in the early church. Like, what is going on? The Holy Spirit really is empowering us. I just healed this lame man. But I love what Peter does here. When the people gather around, what does Peter do? He deflects the glory. He says, why are you looking at us as though we did this by our own power or our own godliness? This was the power of Jesus Christ, and he deflects glory. Just a side note, your accomplishments as you make your way through life, as people praise you for your accomplishments, just deflect the glory. Thank you, this was, this was the Lord. The Lord's gonna use that as an opportunity, as a window to share about Jesus. So that's what Peter does, he deflects the glory. He says, guys, this wasn't us, this was Jesus, let me tell you about him. Remember, you crucified him. You gave Barabbas over instead of Jesus. Listen, you did this in ignorance, you didn't know it, but you crucified the Messiah, the Christ. And he crucified for our sins, rose again, and then verse 19, he says, this is what you need to do, repent, repent. Listen, I'm not advocating for this fire and brimstone message on the streets, repent or go to hell. All right, a lot of street preachers do that. Maybe there's a time and a place for that, but listen, what Satan loves to do is discourage us from calling people to genuine repentance for fear of offending them. We have become so soft in our generation. It is our sharing of the gospel that includes this calling towards repentance that produces the benefits of repentance, a blotting out of sin and a refreshing of the soul. Listen, if our gospel message, if our sharing and telling of the gospel does not include this call to repentance, turn to God and turn from sin, then we are simply telling people to add Jesus on to their already messed up lives. And that is not what Jesus came to do. Jesus did not come to be added on to our already messed up lives. He came to do a complete overhaul of our lives. That's what repentance is. And when we share the gospel and we don't include the turning from sin, the coming to God, that call to repentance, we are doing them a disservice. Repentance, it's a Greek word, metanoeo, and it means to change the mind or to change direction. That's what repentance means. We're scared of that word repentance because sometimes it carries the connotation of just this harsh street preacher. But repentance is the most biblical part of the gospel because repentance means a turning from sin, a turning from this direction towards destruction, turning from that and turning towards Jesus. And you cannot turn towards Jesus unless you first turn from where you were first going. That's what repentance is. And so many people just wanna add Jesus onto their lives and Jesus wants to do so much more. He says, I don't wanna just be added onto your life. I wanna do a complete overhaul of your life. And that means turning from sin, repenting, coming towards me and surrendering everything. That's the gospel. The first word of the gospel, Peter says, repent. Repent. And look at what repentance then produces. Verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Blotted, it's a Greek word, exalipho. And it has this idea of completely wiping ink off of a document. In the ancient day, ink, it didn't have the same um, acidic levels of our ink today. And so 
you could write out a document in ink and then almost completely blot it and erase it away just using like a damp cloth. So Peter's sharing this idea of, listen, when you repent, when you change your thinking, you change your direction, you turn from sin, turn from all that stuff that you've been doing that you know is wrong, you turn towards the Lord, this is what that will produce. God will wipe clean your record. You don't need to wrestle with guilt. You don't need to wrestle with shame because when you come to Jesus with all of your sin, God blots out your sin. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, so far will I blot out your transgressions from you. So when you come to Jesus, when you repent, God does this cleansing work in our heart and in our lives where he completely wipes our slate clean. It's a fresh start in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that repentance produces. And he also says repentance produces that your sins may be blotted out, but so that also times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Refreshing, it's a Greek word, anapsuxis, and it means a recovery of breath. You guys ever been working out, been exercising, been on a run, been mowing the lawn, come back home, sit on the couch, <sighs> recover, you catch your breath. This is what repentance produces. The Bible says that when you come to Jesus Christ, you turn from sin, you come to Christ, you repent, you change your direction, your thinking, that God will wipe your record clean, but he will also give you this refreshing, recovering work where you can actually now relax. Guys, no more striving. No more striving. A lot of us just striving. Do more, try harder, God will accept me. If I just do more, get more religious, adopt more tradition. Guys, repentance is the relaxation from striving because the work was finished on the cross. That's why Jesus stressed his arms and says, it is finished, the work is done. So that the work was placed on Jesus so that you can stop striving in your own strength and effort. You can recover, you can refresh. This is what repentance produces. And listen, in our sharing of the gospel, when we sell people short and we don't mention repentance, a turning from sin, we are leaving out, we are neglecting what repentance produces. The person you're sharing the gospel with will not experience this blotting out of sin, this refreshing that comes only from repentance. But we think we're doing this loving thing by just, I don't wanna get too scary. I don't wanna use the uh, 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 harsh biblical word like repent. So I'm just gonna say, hey, Jesus loves you. Just come to Jesus and Listen, that's fine. I've told people Jesus loves you. I've told people just come to Jesus. But in those moments when you're sitting with people, when you're talking with people about the gospel, when you're explaining Jesus to people, you cannot leave out this essential part of the gospel which is a turning from sin, turning towards Christ. Because what repentance produces is the blotting out of our sin by the power of God and by just this refreshing work of the Holy Spirit. So for the believer in the room who wants to share the gospel, it's this call to be a generation that preaches repentance. We've lost that in our generation because we're afraid of how that comes across. We're afraid of offending people. Listen, truth offends. And I don't mean share the truth in an offensive tone, but truth by nature stings and pierces. That's what the word of God does. As we mentioned before, the word of God pierces our souls. But the Holy Spirit will do his work by his power, through the word, through your just honesty to the gospel. Turn from sin. Repentance just means change the direction you're going. Come to Christ. And then you can share the benefits of repentance, which is God will wipe your slate clean. He will refresh your soul. So for the believer in the room, let me encourage you, be a generation that preaches repentance. Let's get back to that. If you're here tonight and you have never repented of your sin, Get right with God tonight. Maybe you've had this intellectual belief in God. You believe that God is there, you believe God exists, but you have never made the conscious decision to turn from sin and to turn towards the Lord, and you've got one foot in the world, one foot with Jesus. If that's you, I bet you're not experiencing that refreshing because that only comes through repentance and you've got worry, anxiety, you've got fear, 
You've got shame. You've got guilt. Turn from sin. Put both feet towards the Lord so that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing recovery might come in. Jeremiah 31, 25 says, God says, for I will satisfy the weary soul and every languishing soul I will replenish and refresh. Let's pray. If that's you tonight, you've been coming to church, been going through the motions, believe God is there, you believe God exists, but you've never made that conscious decision and effort to turn from sin, and to turn towards the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity tonight to do that. And all you need to do is just come clean before the Lord. Just confess sin. Just say, God, I've sinned against you. And I turn from that way of living. And I turn towards you, God. I repent. I believe that you died for my sins and rose again. I trust you as my savior. Just do that, just whisper a, pr a prayer right now to the Lord. Just get right with him. And when you do that, the Bible says that your sins will be blotted out. That times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. God, for those of us who maybe we've been walking you, with you for some time, I pray that this story from Acts chapter 3 would challenge us in a few different ways. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be more sensitive to what you want to do in our lives and in our busy schedules. Help us, Lord, to be interrupted, to be willing to be interrupted. Just help us, God, just not, not just to be so distracted by the cares of the world. Help us to be willing to be sensitive to those ministry opportunities that you want to bring along our paths, Lord. Help us to be bold like Peter was. Help us, God, to be a generation that preaches repentance, that calls people to genuine repentance, Lord. Help us to be bold in sharing our faith. And that we're, as we're having conversations about Jesus with people, help us by your Holy Spirit to call people to repentance, Lord. Do the work that only you can do by your power, God. We look to you, we rest on you. We can't do this on our own, Lord. It's so easy for us to be distracted and busy, just go about our lives. It's so easy for us not to wanna offend people and not to go, just deep into the heart of the gospel because we're afraid of what, might, what people might think or how people might react. Just pray that you would encourage us by the early church here just to be bold men and women for you, being willing to be interrupted, calling people to repentance, getting to the heart of the gospel, God. We love you, God. I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. Pray that you would do a great work in their lives as they go about the rest of their week at work, at home, with friends, with family. Do a wonderful work in their hearts, Lord. Fill them fresh and full with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our ministry, in our community, in our midst. We love you. We praise you. All of our faith and trust is in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people together said, amen, amen. and amen.